Rick, thank you, and, and thank you for having me today. It's interesting, um, I'm going to talk a little about innovations in the emergency department, but just kind of as a general theme of what I'm looking at, is you're the core of healthcare reform. Whether you like healthcare reform or not, it's here, it's a fact. Healthcare reform provides a ton of entrepreneurial events that you can get involved in, and I really believe you should be the leaders in that. And I'm going to try to talk about how nurses, physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners can all take part of this and really be an important part of healthcare reform and really almost reinvent what we do as emergency physicians in, in some capacity. So let's talk a little bit about healthcare economics just for a few minutes, and this really does go well with uh, Brent's lecture. If I could, a um, little bit, and we've talked about this forever, the GDP. The point here is, if you look at how much revenue is coming in and how much we're spending and where we're going to be with interest, this is what's driving all these changes. So healthcare reform, to me, is a response, an economic response. It is tipping the revenue upside down. It is now going to be looking at taking care of populations versus piecemeal care. Real important to, to remember, though, we can't sustain, as Brent was saying, this path. This is going to be something that's self-destructive and something that we're going to have to rethink. And if you look at health care reform, you see that we spend a lot in the U.S., almost twice as much as any other country. And what do we get for that? Well, we really don't get a whole lot different. What we do get is about half as much spending on NIH, NASA, military um, advances. Um, you know, NASA brought to us a lot of uh, things like Velcro and a lot of innovations that we're not seeing because there's just no more room to really invest in that anymore. You're also seeing that we're spending all this money and we're really looking at what does it get us. So um, I did do my residency at USC so I will take a little shot at UCLA here. Um, UCLA is, as you can see, and this stat is a couple years old, but UCLA has a kind of a quality score that is much less than the Mayo Clinic Hospital, and it spends a much, a much greater amount of money, and it also has a much longer length of stay and uses a significant number of specialists in a much bigger way. So if, just to recap those last couple of slides, we're on an unsustainable path. We can't afford to do the things like NASA, NIH, and other ways to advance our culture and economics. We're looking at variation that's considerable amongst high institutes, I mean, pl places that have great reputations, but yet have very different uh, quality markers and how much they're uh, charging. And this is um, life expectancy in the U.S. So if we really look at what we're getting for that dollar, it's not a whole lot. If you, um, these 30, you add 30, so at the corner where it's 0 and 34, it's 30 plus 34 and as it goes forward. So we're roughly around 71 years of age for life expectancy. Look at those other countries, and they're spending half as much money. So this is what all the politicians are thinking about, and I'm going to go into really talking to you about what we're faced with. People are adding this up, and people are looking at it whether we believe it's true or not, whether we want to uh, really um, live up to what we need to do, this is happening and people are really looking at us to come up with changes. And I think emergency medicine can do that. Um, and one last uh, slide on economics. As we all know and all thank God, we're extending our lifespan, so we've got a lot more people in the mix. As soon as these baby boomers really get into that Medicare realm, you're going to see a significant increase in expenditure just based on volume. So let's kind of get out of the ER just for one minute and talk about healthcare reform and market pressures. So what does that really mean? So this is our current model. We're focused on quality. We're focused on safety. Uh, we had a, just that great lecture on, on safety. We're focused on patient satisfaction and throughput, all very important nurse re, uh, relations, administrative relations. We're focused on data collection, benchmarking, and pay for performance. That's our current model. That's what emergency medicine is doing, and it's doing well. <clears throat> but I'm going to talk to you about how this is being disruptive. We're, if, has anyone read the book, Clayton Christensen? It's a great book. I'm going to, I have a reference in the back. It's a book I think everyone should read. But he talks about this disruption in the business model. And I'm going to go through some examples of other industries that do it. 
But if you just look at our health care for a second, you see fee-for-service. We were in silos, and we were really just doing what we wanted to do on a piecemeal. Then all of a sudden, we started to get um, dinged, as it would be, for readmissions. So readmissions, not that long ago, provided income to both the hospital as well as the physician. And now we're talking about value-based purchasing, how we're actually going to have money taken away from us if we don't hit certain core um, structures in our quality as well as our patient satisfaction. And bundling. Anyone here from Geisinger? Geisinger has already put together a bundling package for those patients that have cardiac disease. So if you go in for cardiac surgery, they say, here's the price. Whether you have a complication, you have to stay in the hospital a little bit longer, you're going to be charged that amount of money. And it's, what's, it's really what's happening in our, our industry right now. <clears throat> we all know about ACOs. We know that they are going to not, excuse me, <clears throat> they're not going to exist um, in about three to four years because their premise is really focused on how much money we can save. So as we save and save for a couple of years, that expenses is divided between hospitals and providers. At some point, that expense savings will go. But what it does is it gives us a foot into population health, and I'll talk a little bit about population health. And again, we've all looked at um, hacks and how we're being penalized for hacks, and we're seeing this little part of CMS called uh, the Center for Medicaid Medicare Innovation that's really looking at how can we keep this uh, moving forward? How can we keep disrupting and focusing on better way of taking care of patients before they get to the hospital? Now, when I talk about the ACA, and I, I think a lot of people in, in my position would agree to this, ACA is a lot of things, but what it does for us is it turns the revenue cycle upside down. So if you look at what's going to happen in the next 10 years, and, and Brent actually spoke to hospitals have to make margins. So you don't make a margin, you don't keep the lights on, you don't keep the heat on, et cetera. But you look at what the ACA is going to do, it's going to take $260 billion out of Medicare. It's going to reduce DISH by $5.2 billion. It's going to reduce um, its share of Medicaid. You're going to see significant reductions in how the federal government is paying for uh, its health care. How many people here are in a high Medicare, high Medicaid volume hospital? Those are going to be the first hospitals that really feel this CMS just did a study. They're predicting out of 769 safety net hospitals, 40% of them will going to get hit with a maximum amount of the readmission penalty, which is 3% of your Medicare um, rate. So if you make $200 million a year in Medicare, 3% of that will be taken off versus the non-safety hospi non net hospitals, which are about 2,500 more, which won't have anywhere near that amount. As a matter of fact, the same study says that CMS is looking at hospitals not making a Medicare margin, 20% of the hospitals not making a Medicare margin. So you think about you're in an emergency department, no matter how good you do, no matter how high your patient satisfaction is, no matter how good your quality is, no matter how good your relations are, if that hospital starts seeing a reduction of 20% in its Medicare uh, volume, you're going to have significant issues with staying afloat, and that hospital is probably not going to survive. Matter of fact, we're seeing a lot in our area, a lot of the smaller hospitals either joining with large uh, systems or actually going out of business and becoming something else. So this Health Care Reform Act is really about turning that revenue stream upside down. Let me kind of explain that a little bit. So what is it really looking at doing? Increasing access, it's looking at providing the consumers with better market value. So how can I choose a better plan? And that's going to be through the exchanges. That's going to potentially commoditize the uh, different insurance companies. You're looking at the decrease in health of healthcare cost as a whole, not just in your hospital, but you're looking at that population is now going to be measured. So how much does it cost per Medicare beneficiary in the area that you live? And then we're talking about population health. Well, let me just talk about population health for one second. Um, population health is five types of people that I, I, I see as in population health. It's those that are well, those that think they're well that need to be uh, screened for high blood pressure, for cancer, for some underlying disease that we need to treat sooner than later. It's those with chronic disease who we need to develop chronic disease maps for and help keep out of the hospital. 
It's for those who really need hospitalization, and that is those patients that have an appendicitis or delivery or need ICU care. And it's long-term care patients, those that need something after they get hospitalized. So that's really what population health is. And I think as emergency physicians, we understand a lot of the different specialties. We understand a lot of the issues that face our communities and our social environment. And we could actually be that core to really provide that care for that population. But it's going to be thinking out of the box. And we're going to be talking about the importance of multi-specialty groups. We're going to be talking about the importance of nurse practitioners and nurses taking care of patients in the population and health managing and coordinating that. And that's where I think emergency medicine really needs to go. It needs to take a look outside the emergency department and how does it get involved in taking care of these populations because it is the front door and it does see what's out there and it is the first, sometimes it's the first act that any patient or person actually has with a hospital. So let me talk to you about other industries. And then we'll bring this all together and really talk about what we should do as emergency physicians, emergency nurses, and people that run emergency departments. So other industries, all these industries have gone through the same thing. The automobile in the early 80s, telephone and communications has gone through it. Uh, the paper mills, um, you now have seen the newspapers go through it. Grocery stores went from small stores to big, huge mega stores. The steel industry and the computer industry. So let me just talk to you about the computer industry for a second and relate it back to how it's really affecting healthcare. When you first started with computers, they were all in the universities. They all had big mainframes. You had to have the highly skilled people taking care of them. You started to see, as, as technology got better, you started to see some mini computers going into the big businesses. You started then seeing desktops, laptops, and personal smartphones now and all the apps, and we're going to talk about that as it pertains to medicine. But you've seen this. This is just one example. This isn't just the computer industry, but this is the automobile industry and the steel, the paper, the newspapers. Now look at healthcare. You're seeing a significant decentralization. Not that long ago, universities were the only people that had CTs and MRIs and did the real fancy surgical procedures, neurosurgical or cardiac. Now, then all of a sudden, some of that technology gets into hospitals, and you're seeing hospitals doing all that with that technology, now able to go into the, into the smaller hospitals. And now we're seeing, especially in our area, multi-specialty groups. Multi-specialty groups have their own surgery centers, imaging centers. They're looking at how they can create an environment where the patient really doesn't have to go to the hospital except for extreme conditions. Mid-level practitioners, nurse practitioners, PAs, going out into the community, coordinating health care, helping significantly with readmissions. If you um, have a good readmissions program, you have a nurse and a nurse practitioner actually helping you run either a clinic or getting out into the community and doing this. You're starting to see retail stores, pharmacies, and clinics. And now you're seeing family care. You're seeing home health, which I think is going to be one of the fastest growing industries, especially if they really understand health care coordination. Um, taking their iPhone with them into the house and doing pulse oximetry, pulses, EKGs, you name it, they can do it on the iPhone. You don't need this big, huge machine to come into the home any longer. It really can be done on the iPhone and transmitted. So you're really seeing this movement away, just like the computer industry, this movement away from the hospital into the community. Um, this focused decentralization, it's really about the price point. People are not willing to spend the money on an emergency department that has a significant overhead. They're, do, they're willing to do it if they have an acute MI and they need to get into the cath lab or they need some other procedure of that intensity. But if they have anything much less than that, they're starting to look at other areas, other venues to get into. Ambulatory cares are now becoming primary cares and urgent cares. Urgent cares are becoming concierge services. Concierge services are becoming very big in the New York metropolitan area. You're starting to see even home visits decrease because of the ability to have these apps in the, in the house. So you're seeing this real disruption of clinical care. At the same time, you're seeing this disruption of how the revenue streams are coming through. Now, as, as a CEO, and I've, I've been a CEO for six years, really becoming less of a CEO of a hospital 
and becoming much more a CEO of a population. So the hospital is something that's important in taking care of patients, especially if they have a need for the OR, the ICU, or some significant surgical procedure. But what we're really seeing is this population, not only am I doing it from an entrepreneurial point of view, I'm doing it because I have to. I'm not being paid the Medicare rates and the Medicaid rates that I used to get. So we have to look at how do we reach out and get our arms wrapped around this population. And again, I'll put out to you, I think emergency physicians have some of the best opportunities to really be partners in this, joint ventures in the hospital administration. You know, I, it wasn't that long ago. I practiced for 20-some years, and there was a complaint. They never listened to me. I, I, I tell them how to make patient satisfaction, but then they reduce an FTE that I can't actually have the greeter to greet the ambulances or, or greet the people, don't have enough nurses, we're holding too many, why can't the patients go up on the floor? It was, you know, why do I have to hold them in the ER? They can be on the floor it's just as easy, maybe even better nursing ratios, all that. I have personally had my own piece of complaining about. But at the end of the day, I think you should take a different look at this take a lead in how we get out of this box. It's not about the emergency department anymore. You are going to become specialists in managing populations. You are a specialist in managing the acute and the urgent care populations, but now you're going to have to be part of how do we manage a bigger population. The only way I'm going to grow right now is in a population growth. So I'm going to have to get more geography, more pathology, in order for me to have the same number of patients coming through the hospital. So that means I've got to manage a larger population, which means I have to have physicians as an integral component of this. There are no, there's just no hospital that can run and do any of this without significant physician leadership and input and caring of the patients. So physician alignment, absolutely incredibly important and the only way it's going to be successful. Consumer convenience. you know. I go to the airport and I have to wait because they're checking IDs and, and all this. Um, and now it's become a little bit easier with the iPhone electronically uh, checking us in. Um, everything is about convenience, I shouldn't say that, up to a point everything is about convenience. So these patients don't want to come in and wait for anything, even if it's a 20 minute wait, let alone two hour wait. If somebody could communicate to them via telemedicine and give them input into the rash. Right now there's an app where you just take a picture of the rash, you send it to the dermatologist and um, dermatologist can make a diagnosis or uh, say, I really need to see you. But you're seeing some significant changes in um, how we deliver healthcare and telemedicine and these uh, apps are gonna be a significant component to this. Um, and then for me, it's a strong balance sheet. I won't be able to, it's, it's about investment, so we're investing in an ACO, we're investing in population health, we're investing in care maps, we're investing in taking care of, more, of bringing more primary care physicians. But how do we do it smartly? We do it, at least in my uh, opinion and in my experience, in these multi-specialty groups, which I think you are a major component of and really need to start thinking about multi-specialty groups. And even employed physician, our, our physician group is employed. There's a way to work with the medical staff and create, and, and we're moving a lot of our employed physicians in, into LLCs um, and actually having them into a partnership so that they can actually share in some, legally share in some of the, the revenue um, that they bring in as well as they can share in some of the expenses they help uh, reduce. So as you're, in a, even in an employed environment, you start thinking about should I, should we become, should the medical staff actually start looking at LLCs? and focusing on how do we create these multi-specialty groups that actually work together and joint venture uh, with, with the hospital. So we talked a little bit about what population health is. Um, I, I do think you're gonna see the, the admission component of it is yours, but I do believe all five of these are yours. And you really need to start thinking about how to get out of that box and become a leader in developing processes and groups that do this. Um, I, again, it's a joint venture, so let me talk to you a little bit about something that we're doing. So why do the multi-specialty group, in addition to all the good reasons of coordinating care? It's, there's another great reason, and that is provider and insurer. So provider-payer relations aren't going to work unless they're the one and the same, in my opinion. 
I believe we're going to be commodities. We physicians are going to be commodities unless we're in a relationship with a payer that's meaningful, not a relationship where every three years they can change the contract on you. So let me tell you what, what we're doing to a, a degree. We're actually creating a, um, enough patients, and we're going to start with Medicaid, and because you can actually make money on Medicaid um, if you really look at population health. And we're going to become a, a insurer of Medicaid. Um, it takes assets and it, uh, it takes investment to be able to back that as an insurer. There's a lot of rules and regs. But the only way I believe that you're not going to be a commodity and you're not going to get into this thing where, you know, you're told what to do and you do it or you leave is to become a provider and a payer. And you're starting to see it. How many people here are from Pittsburgh? Anyone here from Pittsburgh? Um, so you know about Highmark and Allegheny. Highmark and Allegheny. Highmark, big, huge insurance company, buying Allegheny and many other. Um, you're seeing uh, MedStar starting to look at, at developing a, a med, uh, Medicaid insurance product. They own Georgetown and the Washington Hospital Center. UPMC has an insurance product that actually is already there. So whether the insurance providers, or I shouldn't say providers, whether the insurance companies buy you as providers or the providers actually become insurance companies, which is, the, I think, the better way of doing it, it is coming. And, and we're starting to see the experiments occurring now, but it is coming. It's much like what I kind of link this to is, is Apple back in the uh, mid-80s. You know, Apple was kind of going through experimental things, of trying things differently, and it wasn't really till the late, uh, mid to late 90s that it really boomed out. But we're starting to see that innovation and technology allowing other people to get involved in, in, in taking care of patients. So we really need to look at how to become a provider and a payer. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> look at, um, there is a lot of risk with this. If you look at fee-for-service, really no risk. You took care of a patient and you ended up um, getting paid for it, whether there was a complication or a problem. As this goes on and you start seeing value-based purchasing, uh, bundling, uh, where you guarantee a price for a specific procedure or diagnosis, whether you see uh, start at an ACO and then ultimately become a provider payer, the risk increase, but the payoff also increases significantly. Um, emergency medicine admissions. If, let me talk about admissions and, and patients that you discharge, because that's what we do, right? We admit somebody or we discharge them. These are all the areas that you can affect. You can oversee the emergency component, the urgent care component. You should really be the ones running the RDU or the observation center. You can create the medical surgical hospitalist and partner with them. You are the hospital experts. You provide the expertise and understand the broad range of specialties better than anyone else. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at just the top two there with hospice and uh, intensive care units, 27.4% of all healthcare dollars are spent on those two blocks. If you actually worked in those areas sp specifically, you would actually see a significant reduction in expenses and an increased profit as it would be to, to the provider side of, of the equation. Um, those patients that are getting discharged, again, the, you're, you should really be focused on the emergent, urgent, you should be running the RDUs, um, telemedicine follow-up is not um, that far off, it's already occurring. Um, Skype is a little bit more difficult because it doesn't have all the HIPAA requirements in place yet, but I guarantee you as soon, as soon as those HIPAA requirements get uh, locked in, we'll, we'll start to see Skype in a much more uh, pro pronounced way in healthcare. Um, primary care visits, retail admissions to the pharmacy, or retail visits to the pharmacy to get the blood pressure rechecked. Um, you're already working on readmissions. You are the experts. The nurses here and the nurse practitioners are the folks in our area that are really significantly impacting readmissions and making it a much better way of, of taking care of patients. You should be involved and really own what EMS do, does. It's not going to be that far off where EMS folks are actually putting some applications on the, on the patients and uh, using telemedicine to relay that information and providing maybe a better spot for that patient than, than the emergency department. And the fact of the matter is, whether you're a healthcare believer or not, healthcare reform believer or not, it's here and people are looking at how to do this. So my answer is emergency medicine should really be the ones in the forefront doing this. 
uh, reimbursement through premiums. So think about this. You're the provider and you're the payer. Instead of being paid for taking care of the patient that's being readmitted for COPD or asthma or the patient that's coming in with a chronic wound or any of the other things that you think about, think about being paid based on the premiums. So you're now being pay, uh, paid um, on a per capita basis for what you do and your expertise. How much of the time are you really struggling, and I struggled with this a lot, the patients that I had to think about the most and the patients that I spent the most amount of time were, were the atypical chest pains and the atypical abdominal pains. Those are the patients that went home and I struggled with. It was much easier to admit, as we all know, it was much easier to admit those patients. But those patients going home now in a way that they can get good follow-up and, and, and you get paid for, for actually doing all that. And that's being paid through the premiums. So we're seeing this new model, new business model, where you're seeing reimbursement as the economic model and you're seeing this management of the population as the clinical model, something that is upside down from what we're doing or currently uh, practicing. Um, just as I, if I could, I think it's extraordinarily impor important, and I think there's got to be a lot more focus on this. We're an academic medical center. We need to survive. There's more expenses associated with an academic medical center, but we also do research and teaching. It's amazing to me, and I've gone and, and looked at, at several medical schools, the Cleveland Clinic's got it right. They come up with a new innovation, and by the way, when I say innovation, it could be technology, it could be how you take care of a population better, it could be anything from A to Z. They got patents. I don't know how many separate businesses the uh, Cleveland Clinic has, but it's significant. They bring in a significant amount of revenue by these patents. There's a lot of our academic medical centers that aren't really focused on really creating a business model to match their clinical model. So when I'm, I'm looking at academic centers, extraordinarily important, very much a part of this healthcare reform, but they gotta figure out more innovative ways of managing the business side of, of what they do. And, and, and patents and really taking credit for some of the research they're doing is a major thing, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. All right, you know, this is where Greg Henry um, is, is um, if he was here, he would argue with me, but since he's not here, I can say anything I want. Um, rates of avoidable inpatient hospitalizations. Um, this is the readmissions. This is the patients going from admission to ops, so they're not getting admitted. We get paid instead of $15,000 per patient, about $5,000 per patient when it goes into an ops. So it's a significant change in how the revenue stream is. But we are looking at how we avoid unnecessary admissions as a hospital, because we're really looking at becoming more of a healthcare provider for a community. And this is where Greg and I might differ. Greg's theory is that if you've got these fixed costs in an emergency department, you should just see as many patients as possible through the emergency department. Um, if the fact of the matter is people are looking at this model and saying, well, you should really be reducing your fixed costs, um, not trying to increase numbers of patients going through it. And whether we believe it or not, people are looking at this. This is our area, Newark. You're seeing that um, we don't do as good as we should. There's a significant amount of best practices that we can uh, bring into practice that will help uh, decrease these and get these patients in a better spot. Now, the only reason I have this slide up here is because I want you to know that this, is, this was done by Rutgers, and at the end of the day, that slide I showed you about patients coming in um, and not needing admissions and patients coming to the emergency department not needing to be there, they could be in another primary care site, this is showing you that people are looking and putting dollars to this. They're saying basically that middle column, if you did this and looked at the cost savings for getting the patient in the right spot at the right time, it's $119 million savings. So whether you think it's $119 million or only $20 million, there are people that are really going to look at entrepreneurial ways of getting patients into different spots in the healthcare continuum. So as a quick summary, um, technology is, is going to be this innovative disruptor. It's, going, it's here. It's, it's just like the computer industry. It's pushed healthcare into a very reasonable way into the homes. Healthcare is being pushed out of the hospitals and into the communities, so we really need to almost reinvent ourselves to some degree. And I don't mean the clinical care that you're giving. I mean how you look at a population or a community that you're taking care of. The payment model is changing. 
It has changed. Between now and 2014, you're going to see significant changes in how Medicare is, is paid, Medicaid's paid, DISH is paid, significant changes. Academics, I believe, is really how we sustain innovation and how we really sustain what we do, both from a clinical point of view as well as from a business and economic point of view. Uh, clinical integration is the only way we're going to survive. And when I say integration, I don't mean just the physicians. I mean the physicians in the hospitals, the physicians and the multi-specialty groups. That's how we survive. And population health is here. We're going to be paid for taking care of patients, and we're going to be, um, have money taken from us for not taking care of them well. I do believe that the real answer is mixing this payer and provider and really becoming something that is more than just a commodity because you right now, I know the payers are looking at how they can come into hospitals and just take a unit and say, we'll pay you X amount of money, but we'll run the unit. So we become an area where you lease space. We almost become a rent or landlord. That is not what we're looking for. So that's why we're really pushing this payer provider. Um, Albert Einstein, this quote, I, I love it, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we've used when we created them. These are great references. Um, Jim Collins, um, he has three things that are just incredible that I, I live by, and it's productive paranoia. You, know, you really got to be paranoid that somebody else is going to do it better than you are. Um, it's discipline. You got to have fanatic discipline in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, and in pure creativity where you're really taking that creative um, need and the, the, the ability to be creative and putting facts behind it. Um, the Clayton Christensen book is, if I was to read one book or two books, it would be the Clayton Christensen book, The Innovator's Solution and Good to Great. So I thank you and um, I don't know if I have any time for questions. I know I've gone to double zero here on the, the counter. Any questions for Dr. Brennan? When I hear you talking about the partnership between providers and insurance companies, what, what brings to mind is HMOs. You know, to me, can, if you can explain a little bit of the difference of how, how you see that as a difference, as a different model, because to me, Kaiser has done it very similarly for many years, right. and some, there were some issues in the 90s when, when they came out. So I'll, I'll tell you, my example is what we're doing. We're a $2.5 billion system it touches two million patients a year, and we're going to take our we're going to take some assets and develop an insurance company, so that we as the providers are the insurance company, which is very different than the HMOs. What the HMOs did were that they became the they became the kind of the third party. So the unions, the companies paid money to the insurance companies and the insurance companies paid to us uh, for doing something and that, that was a contractual relationship. What we want to do is create our own insurance product and go to the unions, which we've already um, had some significant conversations with, go to the self-insured, significant, you, you'd be surprised how many of the main corporate entities throughout this country are insuring their own uh, population of, of employees. And we're going to look at how to do it from a separate product with Medicaid. So we, the providers, are actually the uh, people distributing the revenue. So the way I look at it, you're taking the middleman out of the way. Correct. The compensation right. So we, the, just to repeat, we're taking the middleman out of the, out of the, the mix. Um, they take 15 to 20 percent off the top, where we could put it into paying physicians for, and nurses and nurse practitioners and PAs for what they do um, versus uh, somebody that's really kind of a middleman distributing the money. And, and, and by the way, the companies that we've spoken to and the unions we've spoken to are very up on this. They don't see any reason to have a 15 to 20 percent middleman um, providing it. But it's hard work and it's something that, that is, is just becoming a part of it, um, whether it's the insurance company. The other thing that's happening, if we don't do that, the insurance companies are going to buy, start purchasing all the providers. So th th that's kind of the, the racist it would be. Any other comments, questions for John? 
John, thank you for Great. coming. Thank you, everyone.